Thanks for joining us for today's episode of The Capitalist Investor. You got Mark and Diamond Hands D. Mark, what's going on, man? I am, uh, what's going on? Not much. I'm feeling pretty good today. It's beautiful outside. It is. It's gorgeous. Got to get, I got to get back into my golf game soon. You know, I'm, st- I'm starting to pick the clubs back up this season. It's tough for me coaching baseball. Yeah. You know, I really mm-hmm. don't get any free time until July. Yep. But I'm getting <laughs> ready, dude. It's right around the corner. I right, we should get out there, man. We will. I've barely played it all this year. I need to I need to start hitting it. Yeah, let me go hack it up when no one's watching me first and then I'll go with you. All right. All right. <laughs> Deal. All right. So for today's uh for today's show, I came across a study that I found to be pretty interesting and I want to talk about it. Um, because it's really not what I would it's not what I would have expected. But this this study says that one third of Americans plan to retire later due to COVID nineteen. And I guess at, at first glance, a lot of people might say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Right. Makes a ton of sense. But here's the issue with that, D. From you know, January of 2020 through mid-June, the S&P is up 33%. <laughs> okay? Yep. So you know, we'll, just, we'll just pick some round numbers. Okay. We'll use a million bucks. If you have less than that, don't feel bad. If you have more than that, that's great too. We're going to use a million bucks. Um, if you had a million dollars on January 1st, 2020, and mm-hmm. you were kind of staring at the finish line, which is retirement, you now have, well, assuming it was all in stocks, which it probably wasn't, but again, let's keep the math simple. I'm not that smart. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so a million is up 33%. By my awful math estimates, you have 1.33 million. Right. It sounds like a nice chunk of change. Yeah, not a bad not a bad uh, time period there. Sounds to me like if that happened to you, you would think it is easier to retire, not harder. Yep. Okay. Now let's look at a different time frame. From January of 2020 until the bottom on March 23rd mm-hmm. of 2020, the S&P was down 31%. Right. That sounds like a million goes down to 690 grand, D. Right. Does that sound good to you? It is a tough pill to swallow for sure. Yeah, that's that's rough. So um, it's got to be a tale of two tapes here, mm-hmm. right? So you had, a, you had a million on January 1st of 2020. You're probably either, you know, down maybe down as far as down 31%, which Mm -hmm. would have you at 690 because you sold at the exact bottom and you have not gotten back in. Or you wrote it out and you're sitting pretty with 1.33 million right now. Right. Based off of this, I guess the headline of this story, one third of Americans plan to retire later due to COVID-19. I would think that there's a good chunk of people that sold they panicked, there, there was fear, and they, ma- they made some pretty bad behavioral finance errors. Yep. I don't see how else we can arrive at one third of Americans are going to retire later, unless a lot of people made some pretty big mistakes. Yeah, I think you nailed it on the head there, uh, as, as always. Um, what this pandemic has done and how people have reacted to it, yeah, I think... Um, kind of brings to light a lot of just financial planning issues in general. And behavioral finance is kind of just the, the you know, natural emotional reaction that people have when, uh, you know, the market fluctuates, usually when it fluctuates down. Um, and I think you could tell just by watching TV, listening to uh, people talk, uh, going on Twitter, you know, there was obviously a lot of panic. There was a lot of oh, uncertainty. Yeah. No one really knew what was going to happen next. Yep. It, it was a daily um, uh, grind. You know, it, it was tough. There's no doubt about it. Um, but that is when your behavioral finance uh, background and how you react to things becomes even more important, right? Yep. It's, it's very easy to you know, stay the course when your account goes up every quarter that you get the statement in the mail. It's uh, really easy. <laughs> so, you know, it, that is not how it always works. And sometimes you have to remind people of that. Um, the market just doesn't go straight up. You know, companies just don't go straight. Stocks don't just go straight up just because they're a good company. Yeah. Right. Um, so <clears throat> how people have reacted to this pandemic um, really shines a light on what their overall financial uh, health was and how 
their financial plan was built. Yep. All right. So a couple things I want to hit on that that were jogged in my in my mind as you were kind of going through your your take there. Um, first things first, uh, retirement savings have been disrupted. Yep. Okay. So I think you and I both know that if we had a million dollars sitting in cash um, and had an opportunity to throw it all in the market on March 23rd of 2020, hindsight being 2020, I think we would, that's funny, 2020. Um, <laughs> I think we would both throw all of our money into the S&P 500. Right. Because you probably doubled, mm -hmm. right? Um, but the weird thing, dude, is this. It says there's an, imp so in December of last year, 22 million people had stopped putting new money into their retirement accounts. Yeah. So while they were panicking, they lost the opportunity to buy in when the S&P was at rock bottom. Right. A big, big mistake. That is, I'm sorry to interrupt you in, in mid thought, but that is the whole power of saving into a plan like your 401k because he gets a dollar cost average in right. there. And when the market's down, you buy more You buy more stuff. That's when you want to double down if exactly. possible. I mean, you probably can't because maybe you're already maxing out your contributions, but man, if anything, I would want to save more money when it's down. Right. That's, that's dollar cost averaging 101. I mean, that's going to boost your returns over time. Yeah, and again, it was a tough time though. You know, people thought they might've needed to have that cash yep. on hand. People thought if they were investing more that it was going to go down. Um, didn't, you know, obviously didn't see the light at the end of the tunnel since we can barely see it right now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, again, it's, it's really having those con convictions inside of your financial plan and, and saving into your plan at work is really one of the most important things you can do. Yeah. All right. So I, I agree with you that times were tough. People didn't know if they were going to have jobs, you know, how, how many rolls of toilet paper were they going to have to go and hoard, <laughs> right? So, you know, they had some big purchases they had to make. Um, but even as of March, there were 14 million, March of this year. Right. I think everyone feels like we're kind of in the clear or at least getting mm -hmm. to that point. Yep. And as of March, 2021, 14 million fewer Americans were saving for their retirement. They, mm -hmm. they paused their contributions. Right. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. <laughs> um, that's just, you know, I mean, we could go into a whole behavioral finance episode here, which I don't want to do, but mm -hmm. I mean, this is just, this is behavioral finance 101. I mean, you cannot make these kind of mistakes and expect to realize good returns over the long run. Right. Which leads me into the next point I wanted to make, D, which is something we've seen you know, a million times already, mm -hmm. right? So if we go back, uh, what is it, 20 years from January of 2001 through the end of 2020, had you invested a dollar uh, or, or all of your money into the S&P in January of, of, 20, uh, of 2001 and rode it all the way through, not making any changes at all, um, all the way till December 31st of 2020, your account was up about 7.5% over the course of that time frame. If you miss just the 10 best days, it's more than cut in half. It goes down to 3.3%. And if you miss the 20 best days, is that that's zero? Yep. We're pretty close. 0 0.69. 0 0.69. That's not good. <laughs> that's missing the 20 best days. And, and if you think about it, D, how many great days did we have after March 23rd? where the market may have been up 3%, 5% in a day. Oh yeah. A lot of them. Mm -hmm. So if you went to cash on March 2nd, 10th, 12th, 23rd, whenever it was, you missed most of those good days. Right. And you completely crushed your annualized return on a going forward basis. And, and that's tough to make that up. Absolutely. And th and that's what we can kind of look back now on and reflect, you know, yeah. after the fact. Yep. Uh, again, it's, it's not easy to be making these decisions, uh, you know, in the heat of the moment and with all, all the stuff going on. Um, but these things have obviously not the specific, you know, pandemic, but there have been blips in the market. There's been bad things that have happened that have caused the market to go down. You know, there there are history lessons that we can take a look at and kind of apply them, apply them forward. Yep. And <clears throat> we've talked about it on the show before, you know, it's, it probably was fairly easy to get out of the market 
in a yep. reasonable amount of time um, when it was, you know, heading down uh, very quickly. You know, you probably could have got out, um, you know, minus 10, minus 12 percent, something like that. The difficult part in this scenario, looking back now, was when to get back in. Yeah. Because the market started rebounding, at least in my opinion, way before it should have. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yep. it, it was that that was the tricky part in 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 my estimation, and and what you just read off there really shows that um, it is if you miss those good days, those big rebound days, you're gonna ha- end up behind where you would have been just by letting it ride out. Yeah, I agree. All right, so here's something I kind of want to go through. I think this will be interesting for for our listeners because you and I were both kind of looking at this like, you know, accounts are up 33% since January of 2020. How is it possible that 34% of workers feel less confident? Mm -hmm. How is that possible? Um, And 23% of retirees feel less confident. So I found this interesting. So I'm assuming this article came from the Employee Benefit Research Institute, which is where mm-hmm. I, I pulled this stuff from. But this kind of breaks down, D, um, which categories of people cause that, that less confident number to go up, right? right. Wh- which, which categories of people feel less confident? So wh- where did that differential, where did that delta come from? Mm-hmm. Um, and if we kind of go through it, those people who are in not as good of health, those people who are in fair or poor health, um, 56% of them feel less confident versus 28% for those people who are in good health. Mm, that's interesting. So that is a, and I guess that all, obviously this was a health scare. Right. Right. So that is a, that's an area of, of distressed confidence, right? Um, when you think about it, healthcare costs can be pretty high in retirement Mm -hmm. and probably those people with some pre-existing conditions are just, they're not feeling as good about retiring right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sure there's also a bunch, a a large group of those people who would rather retire because they don't want to go back to work, Mm -hmm. you know? So, um, but that, I found that to be interesting. So that was a big diff right there. Uh, the next one is lower household income. So if your household income was less than 35 grand, you're at 52% of people are less confident versus 28% if they're making 75 grand and above. Mm. So that could be a that that could be due to the fact that the people that are making less than 35 grand a year didn't realize that 33% gain in retirement assets. Maybe they don't have a lot of right. of investments that went up. Mm-hmm. So I think that's kind of interesting as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this the it, it is again looking back at things and and how all this went down. It, it is very telling that everyone out there basically has their own opinion on on yep. how things went down, um, and your confidence as it relates to finances, depending on you know where where you fall into line here, is um, it's eye opening for sure. Yep. All right, next up is uh, those people who have less than $10,000 in savings or investments, which is kind of what we just alluded to, yep. right? 49% less confident versus only 26% less confident if, you're, if you have 100000 or more in savings and investments. Yep. So, you know, a lot of these, I guess when I'm looking at this stuff, D, I'm thinking almost exclusively about like us and our clients. Mm-hmm. You know, people who have saved, have invested, and they've got a nest egg. Right. So I, I sometimes forget to remember that, that there's, there's a whole nother group of people out there who are not clients of our firm, mm-hmm. right? Who are living paycheck to paycheck, who don't have savings, who don't have investments and, and this beat them up a little bit. Right. Right. Um, so I found that interesting. We then go on to uh, people with a lot of debt are feeling less confident, which is weird because credit card debt overall has come down. Right. Delinquencies are down. But when we look at people with a major debt problem, they're 47% less confident versus people with no debt problem, only down 23%. Mm-hmm. Guys. So it seems like <clears throat> I have some more numbers here too about general re- retirement savings, but it seems like the what this pandemic has done as kind of brought light to people's uh, financial issues that they already had. Yeah. You know, so it's 
like the savings is, is something that really came to, to, to mind for me when, when I was preparing for, for this show. Um, it is pretty eye opening to see how many people, you know, when that paycheck got turned off for two weeks, that was a, a huge issue for them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, um, I, I, the number of people with zero retirement savings is 25% of workers. Um, but also what I found crazy was, and these are 2001 numbers or 2001, 2021 numbers from, uh, PWC, uh, okay. one of their most recent surveys. Um, 13% of people who are over 60 have $0 in retirement savings. Yeah. That's, that's, that's crazy. That is you nuts, know? man. Um, so yeah, you, you said it. A, and, a, and you're relying a hundred percent on social security at that right. point to mm -hmm. save the day. Mm hmm uh, also, in that study, only 36% of people feel that their retirement plan is on track. What percent? 36. Well, that's not good. It sounds like they need to get a retirement plan. <laughs> yeah, so. I might know a guy. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, we, we talk a lot on, on the show about financial planning and things like that. But if you even have a plan, you're ahead of the ball game, right? Yeah. You're ahead of the curve. Without a doubt. Um, and if you can work. At least you know. Right, Exactly. Knowing is, is, is half the battle. So, you know, just coming up with, even if it's a simpler plan, um, again, based around, you know, emergency savings, getting that on track. Cause again, you know, people are living paycheck to paycheck, but you know, there's also the, the spending that can be a problem, right? It's, it's oh, yeah. buying that new car before you put a thousand bucks in the bank or, you know, upgrading your, your next vacation before you put that money in the bank. Yep. So it's, um, it's not always the most fun thing to talk about. Sometimes it's like going to the doctor, right? But yeah. you know, you have to start with the basics. Um, and I think this this COVID nineteen pandemic has really brought a lot of those issues to the forefront, which I think is why people are starting to respond this way on on these types of surveys. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to skip over some of the you know whether or not they have a defined contribution plan, defined benefit plan, all that stuff. There's three at the bottom here that I think are interesting. Mm -hmm. So the one is married versus not married. Um, those people who are not married were significantly less confident than those people that are married. Mm -hmm. And okay, maybe that's the dual income thing. Maybe it's just having someone else that, that <laughs> can make you feel better about yourself. Right. Um, but it goes from 41% to 30%. Mm -hmm. All right. So 41% less confident if you are not married. Um, then we move into college degrees. So those people with less than a college degree are less confident than those people with a bachelor's or higher. Mm -hmm. So that's 40% versus 31%. That makes sense. Yep. All right. So a lot of this stuff is pointing towards, you know, if you are educated and you are in a higher paying job and you have saved for retirement and you've got a decent nest egg, all of those things, which makes up, you know, a good chunk of our clients. I wouldn't say every single one of our clients checks off all those boxes, but mm -hmm. um, you're probably feeling more confident today. Right. But for everyone else, which is a large percentage of the American <laughs> population, you are feeling less confident. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to hit on, which is very strange to me, is women are much less confident than men. Yes. Um, women at 38% versus men at 30%. I wonder how much of that has to do with some of them being forced to stay at home and, and, and coach their kids through Zoom classwork mm -hmm. um, and maybe forego the opportunity to work. I wonder why that happened. That's very strange to me, but I think it's something worth calling out because, you know, a lot of people have been talking about wealth equality and, and you know, from a racial, social, uh, gender standpoint, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I found that to be interesting. For sure. And um, I'm looking at, just a little different study. Um, again, this is from the PwC. 56% uh, of male pre-retirees say they were secure in their retirement savings compared to 40% for women. So just a little yeah. different take, but that was one of the things that jumped off the page uh, at at me as well. Yeah. Um, and I don't really have a good explanation for that one, quite honestly. Yeah. Uh, I, I really don't. So so here's, here's what happened. So it was... Um uh, let's see, pre-retirees and then, 
All right, so in January of 2020, 61% of men were confident, mm. and it went down to 56%. Yep. Okay, so let, let's just, let's start there. So there, it seems like when I look at these numbers, males have always been higher than females. Right. Okay. Um, but let's just talk the delta. Like how, mm. much did, how much did this actually beat up your, your confidence as it relates to retirement? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we look at the delta, um, men went from 61% down to 56%. So that is a 5% drop. Right. Women went from 54% down to 40. It is a 14% drop. So it's not just like the headline number D, mm. but it's also the change that I think is most important because that, that's the change that was a direct result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Right. So yeah, I mean, that's a huge drop off. Um, and it's great that you can compare the pre versus post pandemic. Yeah. Uh, but that's a really big drop for, for the confidence of, of women there. And um, again, you know, I, I, I think wages were affected a little bit more for women than for men, but not in, in such a big way, right? The 14% Delta there. Yeah. Um, so it's, um, it's just one of those things that's, we're going to have to see play out because I, I don't have a great answer as to why that is. Yeah. Um, but it, you can definitely tell. And and honestly, I think you can tell just by talking with people, me talking with, with my clients as well. Um, it seems to be the case overall. But again, I, I feel that's kind of a big generalization that, that women are, are just more worried about the the aftermath of COVID than, than men. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. What do you yeah. think? Yeah. Um, I, if I had to put my finger on it, man, I, I would I would assume that in the pre-retiree category, some of it has to do with so, with a per, a higher percentage of women um, not being able to get back to work because their kids are at home being Zoom schooled. Right. So again, I'm just making that up, man. I'm just <laughs> giving you my gut feeling, but I I think that may have weighed on it. I don't think it's just a you know, men and women have different psyches as it relates to, mm -hmm. to retirement planning. I, th there's got to be an underlying reason. And that that's the only one I can really think of off the mm -hmm. top of my head. No, that's a good one. Um, all right. So we kind of went through this. What, what, what do you think are the key takeaways here? What, what should people do to make sure that, you know, they're not stopping their retirement savings when, uh, you know, when the, when they should be cranking it up in dollar cost averaging in. What, what, what are your, your takeaways from this study and, and from this episode? So I, I, that is a, that's a great segue to kind of what I think. Um, it's, there, there are two things in my career that, that really stand out that, that I'll never forget. You know, number one is not a specific timing or any, not a specific time. Um, when we would teach these college education classes, retirement classes, and, you know, in multiple settings, but the ones I did the most were in a classroom. Um, after every class that I taught, it was like like clockwork. At least two or three people would come up to me and say, hey, man, I, I, that was a great class. I really enjoyed it. I wish I had done this five years earlier. I wish I had done this 10 years earlier. Yeah. Uh, I know you've had the same experience there it's never too early to start this stuff. And, and, and it doesn't even take that much time, especially if you're younger, you know, you, you mentioned before, you know, just knowing is half the battle, right? Yeah. Um, everyone has to start somewhere. Um, and if you're at the beginning, that's fine. Um, but you know, educate yourself as to what you need to do to get into a, a nice retirement. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's my number one thing. You start with a plan, I think, yep. you know, like you start with a plan and the plan should guide you and kind of hold you accountable and it's not going to do everything, right? you know, <laughs> but at least like it gives you some perspective, mm -hmm. right? And, and the second thing is, uh, you know, I've mentioned this before. Uh, I'm not sure if it was on the show, but I, I taught a class and essentially three years went by and I got a call out of the blue from this lady who said, Hey, Derek, you know, I don't know if you remember me or not, but I took your class three years ago Wow! and uh, I'm ready re to retire. I'm actually retiring in two weeks. <laughs> so I think I'd like to come in for that consultation now. Um, That's and great that she's doing that, <laughs> but we've, I've, I've used that in classes that I've taught where it's like, 
you don't have to wait until like you're you've handed in your your papers right in, th- in fact it's better like it's better to start s- as soon as you possibly can mm-hmm. you know yep for sure no, i don't want to cut off your story Get oh that's all you know so i was like sure you know come on in uh let's let's talk and um there was just some very elementary stuff in there that had we talked three years ago i mean we i don't even need to to work with her um, had we talked three years ago, I would have been able to point her in some better directions. Yeah. Even like I said, without working with me. Um, but at that point she was pretty much locked into what she had. Um, couple of, you know, commission based investments that, that didn't perform very well over that time period, um, that, that could have been used in, in different ways. Um, so again, it's never too early to start. Um, whether it's listening to this podcast or checking out some of our videos or, you know, talking with an advisor in your town, uh, whatever the case may be, you know, try to at least get to, to first base, if you will, you know, yep. get that single, at least know where you stand and what you need to do to, to get better position for retirement. Heck yeah. And th- that will allow you to at least feel more confident when bad stuff happens because more bad stuff is going to happen. I'm not sure when it's going to be, but it's it's going to happen. It's not going to be, you know, just smooth sailing from, from here on out. No doubt, man. All right. So I love everything you said. I'm just going to add one little layer of things that, that I'm kind of taking away from this. Um, you mentioned the college classes that we used to teach. Um, and one of the things that, that we kind of stumbled across while we were teaching those classes and, and sometimes we'd actually refer to it as we were teaching was that Vanguard report. Mm -hmm. Vanguard did that study on, they were trying to quantify the value of a financial advisor, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, it's tough to quantify. And the thing I like about the Vanguard study is Vanguard did this study at a time when they employed zero financial advisors. So it was completely independent and unbiased, which I think is, that's the way a good research report should be. For sure. Right? and they they tried to quantify the value of a, of a good financial advisor, not someone who just gets paid to throw you in an asset allocation strategy, mm-hmm. but someone who's looking at, you know, distribution planning, like how do we get your money to you in retirement, tax planning, all that stuff. And if I remember correctly, D, the value of behavioral coaching was about a 1.5% per year, right? 150 basis points of additional performance without that advisor picking better stocks, mutual funds, better investments at all, your performance went up by one and a half percent on an annualized basis just because you had somebody protecting you from your own worst enemy, which at oftentimes is yourself Mm -hmm. because you panic, right? Mm -hmm. So that to me is what kind of, you know, rings true front and center. Um, You gotta have a good behavioral coach, right? Mm And look, we, we've got a lot of people listening to this podcast who like to invest on their own. Mm -hmm. That's cool. So I love it. I love the fact that you love to invest on your own. That's great. Uh, but I also think striking some balance is important. So we'll go back to that million dollar number. Maybe Mm -hmm. you just absolutely love watching CNBC and Fox business all day long. Right. And, And you like to act on some of your favorite stories that you hear throughout the day or throughout the week, year, whatever it might be. Um, as you're doing that, if you got a million bucks, you need to figure out like, all right, how much of that money should I really have managed by someone else who is not going to let me do what I'm not supposed to do? You know, how much should I outsource? And Mm -hmm. and maybe that's 900 grand and maybe you keep a hundred grand and and you tinker with it. Mm -hmm. Right. And if that hundred grand that you're managing goes down to 50 grand, maybe at that point you decide to hand that over to, (laughs) right. And just enjoy, you know, pre-retirement and retirement instead. But I think striking some balance to make sure that you've got a behavioral coach is, is I think that's the most important takeaway for me, D. Yeah, for sure. All right. So that wraps up today's show. As always, shoot us over questions, info at swpconnect.com. Um, feel free to, uh, to ask us questions. Give us some topics that you may want us to talk about on future shows. We'd appreciate that. Give us a five-star review. Hit the subscribe button. Let your friends know about us, and we will talk to you next week. The opinions expressed in the podcast are for general informational purposes only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any investment, legal, financial, or tax strategy. It is only intended to provide education about the financial industry. Please consult a qualified professional about your individual needs.